Good morning. Actually, correction, good afternoon. If you haven't uh, received your snack, um, please feel free to do so while I'm uh, still beginning today. So thank you for joining us for this presentation. Hopeton, Will, and Tim were here yesterday arranging computers to be able to offer this PowerPoint presentation live, and it will also be on Zoom. We will also upload to YouTube for those that could not make it. Thank you for those who prepared in advance for your help. I also want to mention that we have an amazing Buildings and Grounds Committee, currently led by Hank Naseby, that for years have kept the lights on, warmed us in winter, and kept us cool in summers. We also appreciate the work of Jeff Griffiths, our facilities manager, and our sacristans, led by Tim and Nate, who prepare our sanctuary for each Sunday and every special occasion and on holidays so that when we arrive, the behind the scenes work is largely invisible and it's meant to be so that our experience can focus on our faith, our worship and our fellowship together. Today, we share information about the often hidden mechanics of our sanctuary. You may recall messaging this past year in the Wednesday News from Central, in Sunday Bulletins, in the Belfry, and in the Strategic Plan. It's been repeatedly stated that we need to do an overhaul of our HVAC system. Bob Carson, who has been caring for our buildings and grounds as long as I can remember, um, I don't think he was here when they built the building, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Bob will soon give you a brief history of the project. We have also shared the news with all of you in bits and pieces that a major capital campaign will be needed to complete this project. Jennifer when I will be speaking to you a bit about financing the overhaul after the presentation. And I would also give special thanks to Martha Jones and her leadership in stewardship, especially now she is exploring uh, many grant programs to be able to assist us with, again, uh, completing this work. Now this project is unlike many that we have accomplished in the past, much of the finished product will be unseen. Yet we all, without exception, breathe the air of our sanctuary. Whenever you are present here, you will be participating in the benefit of this historic undertaking. We are doing this project because we care about our physical historic building, our congregation, our community partners, and our future as a possible World Heritage Site. Thank you to those who are present in the sanctuary and to those on Zoom who are joining us. I did speak this morning at the 9 o'clock service and invited folks to attend if they can. And if they cannot, uh, come and be on Zoom or do an upload to YouTube uh, or view an upload to YouTube, uh, we will make our best efforts to make personal visits to those folks. So now it gives me great pleasure to ask Bob Carson to share more about the project's history. Sorry, Bob, about the aside. <laughs> so we're here to talk about the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system for this building. For those who are, are not into acronyms, the acronym for that is HVAC, or heating, uh, or high vac. Um, and what 
I thought I'd do is to try to briefly bring you through how we got to where we are this morning. The story really begins in the first half of 2020 when it was announced that COVID-19 had arrived in the U.S. And the church took that notification very seriously and in response uh, suspended services in the sanctuary. Uh, and we made changes to our protocols and our equipment uh, as best we could. We started, we started with the easy steps, hand sanitizing stations at the entries, spaced seating in the sanctuary, required masking, etc. Uh, but it was all to minimize the spread of potential uh, virus. In, in middle to late, uh, oh, I'm sorry, what got Buildings and Grounds real attention was an announcement in July of 2020 from the World Health Organization that the COVID virus transmission is dominantly airborne and that we needed to be very concerned about the indoor air quality in this sanctuary. And we improved the filtration on the, on the furnaces which circulate the air in here. However, uh, they do just that at the present time. That is to say, they take indoor air, they take it through the furnace or the air conditioning coils, and then blow it back into the sanctuary. There is no ventilation with fresh outside air. And we assumed that that would be, that that was a problem. So, uh, Buildings and Grounds launched into action, and I will not try to tell you that it was done in the most efficient fashion. Uh, we initiated a plan to ventilate the sanctuary with fresh air using the existing ductwork uh, for the distribution of both heat and air conditioning. That was a mistake, but we, we started that direction because we thought that would be possibly uh, the most efficient and cost uh, minimal way to proceed. We had an a engineering firm uh, design an uh, air intake system for the existing ductwork that would have been up in the belfry, brought in fresh air, mixed it with the air that the furnaces were circulating, and then blow that ventilated air into the sanctuary. At the same time, we knew that the four gas furnaces that heat this building were, three of the four, were 20 years old and were near or at the end of their design lifetime. They needed to be replaced. So if we were going to do this job, it was clear that we ought to not only improve the ventilation, but we also should replace the gas furnaces. With that information, we went out and requested proposals from three HIVAC contractors to do this job. The process got infinitely more complicated when all three came back and said, it can't be done. No one makes these furnaces anymore. They are simply not available. At that juncture, uh, oh, one of them suggested that they could, in fact, do it, but they would put in two residential furnaces for every one furnace we currently have. That would mean the sanctuary was heated or, and circulated by eight furnaces. And we in, at Buildings and Grounds decided there has to be a better way to proceed than that. So, 
there was another announcement uh, that came at that time, and that was from the International Energy Agency, which reported that if we were to meet the 2015 Paris Climate Accords, no new fossil fuel furnaces could be installed or should be installed after 2024. Right? Well, we have four gas furnaces. Um, whatever we install at this juncture is going to determine the fuel we use for the next 20 years. And so, in fact, we stepped back and decided that we had to reassess the situation. Uh, we have had a, you, many of you do not know this, we have had a long and very successful association with a company known as the Stonehouse Group. Uh, in 2009, they put together a plan for us on how to maintain all of the buildings on our campus. And they came in, they evaluated each building, they evaluated the roofing, the flooring, the electrical systems, the plumbing systems, the paint job, um, anything that might require maintenance. And they set out a 10-year plan for us prioritizing those things that needed to be done immediately, those that could wait a few years, and then when that should be completed, how much it would cost, and how often the recurrence interval for doing that maintenance uh, had to be performed. That has made Buildings and Grounds job much easier and I think um, saved us a good deal of, of money and wasted effort. That first plan ended in 2019 and we enthusiastically stepped up and have uh, contracted with Stonehouse again to uh, for a plan that runs from 2019 to 2029. Given our past positive experience with Stonehouse, we decided to talk with them about indoor air quality and the HIVAC system in this sanctuary. Um, the first thing they did was installed two air sensors in the sanctuary that run continuously. Um, you can see two of them here on the walls below the, the second sconce from the front. Uh, and we then did our due diligence to see whether or not Stonehouse could appropriately assist us further with the selection of a uh, heating and cooling system. And they have real expertise uh, in this area. They have worked for multiple colleges, multiple churches, um, community organizations here and in Washington, D.C. And so we felt comfortable in contracting with them to oversee the decisions that we have to make about a replacement heating and cooling system. And with that brief background, I'm going to turn this pulpit over to Larry Amy, who is the managing principal and one of the founders of the Stonehouse Group, to explain what happened after we dumped this issue into their lap. So, Larry. Thanks, Mary Catherine. Hopeton, thanks for the call out. And uh, wow, what a nice group. I'm used to being here not talking about HVAC, but rather having a sugar cookie and listening to Vespers or Love Feast. Uh, I've been a part of the Moravian community for, uh, at least through the academy, for the last 25 years. I'm going to make this as simple as possible. Bob, Bob provided all the background but we're gonna make it as simple as possible. 
This is a bit who we are. Uh, you'll notice this little stone farmhouse. That's where our office was for five years. Our business has expanded um, to be international and national, but we've always been based here with our heart right right here on the uh, Lehigh Plain Fields is where our original office is, and I'm sure many of you recognize uh, the Flatiron Building, which we've been Like that? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'll stand, I'll stand it up and closer. There we go. Uh, I won't rewind, though. Uh, so that's a, little bit about, that's a little bit about us. So we've been working uh, with uh, the team. We have a Monday call. Sometimes we cancel it, but it's no more. Uh, it's, it's at least every two weeks, if not more often. Uh, through our selection process, we added Snyder Hoffman, a local engineering firm, uh, to the team to do the design. Uh, that was also a competitive process. I'm assisted by Joe Narkovic, who is a mechanical engineer. I am not. Uh, Joe is a Lafayette grad and does most of our energy modeling uh, and has also been um, co-author with me of several, several papers on um, post-pandemic HVAC work. So Bob shared this. I'm not going to spend a long time on this. Um, but I think it's worthy of saying the pieces that surprised us uh, and that maybe help uh, provide some greater context is that when the building was built, it didn't have HVAC. Some time ago, it went from coal and wood uh, to gas. So every one of those processes, every one of those changes says, do you want to embrace the previous style or do you want to embrace what is now required? So if we were to design a building this size for this type of use, we would require outdoor air to be able to be injected, brought into the building. So the notion of being grandfathered would have been possible, but it would have not been best practice. And we went into this process about looking at the indoor air quality, there's two sensors here, with the expectation that given the age of the building, that it would be leaky, we call that infiltration, that it would be drafty. And to our surprise, it was less drafty than we expected. So we weren't getting air infiltration at the rates that we would have expected. We also did a thermal imaging scan of the outdoor windows um, and the, what we call the envelope to see how it performed. And it too showed that it was performing better than we might have expected. Well, that better than might have expected now has uh, an added input to the notion that using the existing system, an adapted residential system, would no longer be appropriate. It wouldn't be appropriate from future code. It wouldn't be appropriate from um, from a climate point of view, and it wouldn't be appropriate, most importantly, from a quality of air perspective. So a little bit more background when we think about, Bob explained the filtration rates. So we know that to combat COVID-19, or really any airborne contagion, that we have two abilities to help us. One is to filter the air. The other is to dilute the air. We can't dilute the air unless we're bringing in outdoor air, and we can't bring in outdoor air unless we're ready to treat it. So this, in fact, is, is suggesting that, um, that in, the indoor air quality, uh, a proxy for it is CO2 levels. And this is showing, the red line is showing uh, 1,000 parts per million of CO2. And we're seeing what happens here over the course of a week in terms of how the, how the, um, the CO2 peaked. It's really interesting to us um, that CO2 is such a good proxy for outdoor air. So a little bit of background. If you were to go outside right now, I suggest that you'd probably find CO2 at about 417 parts per million. That's 50% higher than it was at the start of the Industrial Revolution. What we believe is that when we have indoor space, when we have indoor gathering, when we fill this sanctuary with people, we want to make sure that we're creating an environment that has enough air dilution, enough outdoor air per person, which is how the mechanical engineers measure it, that we can maintain levels of CO2 that are closer to outdoor. We expect it to go up subtly, 
but we don't expect it to peak like we were seeing here. This is fascinating. I enjoy working with Professor, Professor Bob immensely because he pushes us to do things like regression analysis for indoor air quality. This is, in effect, what we have here. And what we're doing is we're charting number of occupants and CO2. And the red line across suggests that at a relatively no, no, low number of people, 150, that we're reaching 1,000. Now, these aren't uh, exact science pieces. It's nothing that happens exactly at 1,000. But these are design criteria that create thresholds around which we want to design systems. So what we begin to see is that at really low occupancy, we're, we're OK. When we push way up, we're not. So a new system isn't going to, this is the other part of CO2, isn't going to just bring in outdoor air whenever it's on. It's going to be smart. It's going to think about how much outdoor air it needs to bring in so that we can also be um, a smarter, better system. And because we're now bringing in outdoor air, we'll bring in outdoor air without treating it on the days when the temperature is OK outside, temperature and humidity. So this is a fascinating graph uh, based on real data. And it's based not on outside or external events where we didn't have necessarily good headcount, but based on your routine services. So summary, furnaces at the end of their life, we don't have the appropriate indoor air quality. And uh, we can't just take and add air to the existing type of system we have. There's not enough capacity to treat that air. So we're left with three strikes. That gives us a conclusion that said it's time to go look for something that might be different. In our organization, we like to say, if you plan, you have the ability to replace not in kind. If you don't plan, you're obligated to replace in kind. When that boiler, when that furnace died on the coldest winter night, you'd be obligated to put back what you had, because that would be the most expeditious. This type of project, this type of thinking says, we need to do a little bit better, and we need to plan for it. That means, for example, replacing the electrical switch gear, which is older than the HVAC system and needs to be upgraded in order to carry the new load. It is interesting to us that outside of the externalities, if this project were in New York City, for example, or if it were in Washington, DC, we'd have requirements that would be more stringent than we happen to have in Bethlehem. But here we have the Caring for Creation resolution. We have the context to say that our obligation isn't just to plan for tomorrow, it's to plan for the long-term future. As Bob suggested, this is a 40, 20 to 40, maybe hopefully 50 year decision. And to be the end of the old rather than the start of the new felt like it would be a mistake to us. Well, all that begins to say that the new system has to align with those ideals. The project goals are pretty straightforward. I've alluded to them. And we'll get into the replacement strategy. So we began with the universe of options. What is the absolute most we can do? What is the most creative thing we can do? Well, Moni and many of us have heard of geothermal. We've heard of what it would take, for example, to take wells and drop them in 300 feet deep and, so, and, and to use geothermal energy to temper the building needs. We did look at that. It didn't take very long to figure out that it wasn't an appropriate use for this application in this location. It is an appropriate use, and actually, the Inflation Reduction Act has made it an even more appropriate look. But even if we go back and check that math with what the findings were then, it still isn't an appropriate uh, option. So we looked at wide and long for the series of components uh, or series of options we had. Uh, two were ruled out and didn't go through the final verification. But these three are, uh, are what are, we're left with. Green is good, red is bad. Uh, on the chart, the far my left, my right, left on my screen, uh, is what we call VRF. These all have nicknames. I will try not to use any acronyms without spelling them out. VRF stands for Variable Refrigerant Flow. We've already talked about HVAC or HVAC. I'm going to quiz you at the end to make sure you know what that is. But Variable Refrigerant Flow um, is a is is the far left. Um, an electric coil is 
what we would have think we sometimes call strip electric heating, where you just have an electric resistance coil, either in a boiler or in a vestibule, uh, and gas. So it seems like magic, and there will be PowerPoints that I've shared or we can do, do further work, but we get a 350% efficient system. Well, we say, Larry, well, that's not possible. How do we put in one and get, get 3.5 out? Well, the answer is, in effect, a heat pump is taking energy in the ambient air and using it to, to do better work. It's a smarter, better cycle. It's an inverter instead of a compressor. It's taking and making, um, also inside, it's distributing very, very consistently, and it's using the outdoor air to its advantage. All of those things give us an efficiency of 350%. The electric coil would be just one or 100%. And gas, even though gas is much cheaper per unit of energy, if you look at simply the direct cost and not all the indirect costs, uh, your gas furnaces now are, say, 85% efficient. A new gas boiler, which is what we'd have to have, might be 94, 96% efficient. So the efficiency is driving the calculations in many ways. That makes the energy cost low. It allows us to have outdoor air. Um, it allows us part of its efficiency is when we bring in air, the ventilation air I talked about, when we eject it, we're taking the energy out of it before we send it back outside. That's called heat recovery or energy recovery. That's part of what also makes it efficiency. Uh, we're having MERV 13 filters. That is the standard which ASHRAE, who's the organizing external not-for-profit that provides HVAC guidance, says is the minimum size that we should have for appropriate filtration. And then this carbon emissions is, is tricky, uh, and again, that could be a whole nother conversation, um, but this is the best from a carbon emissions point of view uh, for a couple reasons. First cost is red. That's probably not what you wanted to see. But remember, if we have high efficiency and even if our first cost is better, over the 20 to 40 years of the life, that first cost becomes whittled away into what we call life cycle costs. So at the end of the analysis where we squeeze the input numbers for first cost and life cycle cost, the systems become almost equal. So life cycle cost analysis says even though first cost is higher, life cycle cost is about even. And I say about even because there's that big variable that has to do with the cost of energy. And, and that's part of what makes the life cycle cost a little bit difficult. So the bottom line is uh, VRF, that's an acronym I know you'll all know after this meeting. Uh, and the 1.9 or 2 million is the other number that I'm sure will stay in your minds. Those are the two pieces that come together to say the VRF is the most optimal system based on the goals, based on the research, based on the engineering, and that we're right at that point now where if it were three years ago, I might have had great confidence in saying, well, I know that the units are available and I know what they're going to cost to put in. We're at a point in time where the supply chain and the cost uh, still give us pause, but we're right at that process right now where the Building and Grounds Committee is entertaining hard bids uh, for that project. Our intention is to speak to you uh, from a project perspective. We don't want to come back, for example, and say, oh, we forgot that the electric infrastructure needs to be replaced. We've gotten all those things. We understand, for example, the landscape needs to be cared for and returned. We understand that the organ blower room needs to be uh, blocked off during construction. We understand that the archival room needs to be integrated into the process. Uh, we've done a lot of homework to make sure that the specs uh, are really good for this. As a matter of fact, we even did three, 3D renderings to make sure we could understand how the ducts and the pipes would all fit through the doorways in a way that it would allow someone like me to walk through as much as possible without bumping my head. So this is an overview. I think we've, we've done this. Again, the web is a great place to provide research on what VRF means, um, but you just need to remember that it's 350% efficient. Um, I talked a little bit about the control and the flexibility in smart building controls. That's something we see. We have these devices. They allow us to be smarter. The controls that come with this type of system are going to be integrated in a way in which uh, it will know, for example, that we're on 
uh, a friendly day outside, and as the congregation comes in, the sanctuary fills up, we're going to bring in outdoor air, but we're not going to treat it because the outdoor air is actually uh, better than the indoor air. That does happen on occasion. And when that happens, we want to make sure we're taking most advantage of that. These systems are optimized to do that. And I talked a bit about uh, waste energy or heat recovery from the exhausted air. So the next steps are, uh, as I suggested, uh, there's a second walkthrough um, for bidders next Tuesday. Uh, and they've got the uh, a week and a half, two weeks to do their math. We'll be sending out an addendum on the bids to give final instructions. Uh, and we'll also be beginning to look at some of the built-in incentives for electrification that PPL uh, offers from time to time. So that's sort of our future work. Let's get a levelized bid. Let's make sure we understand the incentives. Let's make sure we understand which manufacturers are, are not only producing on schedule, but also producing um, the best equipment for the least price. So. Deep breath and, uh, and questions. I know Vespers would be more interesting than HVAC. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. S I will repeat the question. The question is, did I say that we were going to be using electricity instead of fossil fuels? That is correct. Uh, VRF runs off of electricity. Um, the PA grid is getting cleaner in and of itself, and then there are strategies that uh, can be used to actually make the input electricity even more um, friendly, so to speak. But yes, VRF is 100% electric. Oh good, I got to go now. In answer to that question, we currently buy 100% green energy, green electricity, and we have a five-year contract for that. So the, the, if when this system comes online, it will be run completely off renewable energy for at least the next five years. Thank you, Larry, <clears throat> excuse me, for joining us this afternoon and also for joining us for the service today. Uh, you could have popped in at the end and we appreciate that you've been here and we know you've been here many times uh, with Moravian Academy as he began at the beginning of his talk. Larry and I have worked together um, on the board of Moravian Academy and um, I have great respect for uh, his wisdom, his expertise. And so we're very grateful to have him join us today. Uh, I wanted to share that this project also has the unanimous, unanimous support of the entire, sorry, question? Okay, can I finish my statement? And then I will come back to your question, thank you. Um, the entire committee um, unanimously agreed that this is the way we need to go with this project and we also have the complete support of the joint board who had opportunities to hear this presentation and to be able to vote on it um, officially. So now, uh, Craig, you have, Craig has been monitoring our Zoom and has an online question. Larry? NVH is what we call that, and the question is, does the new system have considerations for noise and harshness? Um, and the answer is yes. So right now we have four units, and the new system has 21 what we call terminal units, meaning that we're blowing air at a slower rate from more units, and that has the ability of um, making it quiet. We will also be having more outlets uh, those are the louvers that allow us to distribute more air at a slower rate. The system also ratchets up and down and sends as much air, air speed, what we call CFM, cubic feet per minute, 
uh, to meet the needs. So on a day where the system's not having to work very hard, it's not blowing at the same rate that it would at maximum design. So the answer is it is good in terms of um, noise and vibration. Has anything else come in as a question? All right. Are there any other questions about uh, the mechanics of this, of this project at this time? I'm going to call Jennifer to come up and speak a little bit about that great big number we all are uh, taking a look at. And she's going to give us a bit about how we're proceeding with some financing. So with the questions coming over and questions from the congregation, the one question that wasn't asked was, how are we going to pay for this? Because as Larry has mentioned, it does have a larger upfront cost. So that is something that uh, we have had a committee working on for several months as well. And right now, uh, paying for this unit will come from three buckets. The first is financing. Now, obviously, financing is not our favorite place to go to, and we are hoping to finance as little as possible for the shortest period of time possible. The second part will be grants. So as is mentioned, Martha has already been hard at work on the grant writing process. Uh, we feel that this, with our historic building and also with the energy efficiency of this project, that it does open up a broad opportunity in the grant space. And the third would be the support and the investment from our church family, as well as the broader community here in Bethlehem and around that. So we are very grateful. We have very good relationships with our community partners who utilize our sanctuary, the city of Bethlehem. We have that history of stewardship and care for creation that our congregation has. But then we also have the news recently with UNESCO World Heritage nomination, and as well as the environmental impact of this project, we feel is going to appeal to a broader community of partners to help fund this important and necessary renovation to our historic structure. So already you've heard that the, the board has voted, the joint board voted to uh, approve this project. And as hoped and mentioned earlier today, to believe is to act. So I am very grateful that our joint board has not only voted to support the project, but has already pledged over 10% of the upfront costs that we anticipated to install it. So thank you for, for your participation upfront and early. So, Addition, uh, additional communication will be coming out to you in the next few weeks so, uh, on how you can support the project and what the opportunities are. If you have any questions or would like to chat after the meeting, I'll be available over here. Thank you. Any questions on that? I should have mentioned that Jennifer is the chair of our capital campaign planning committee, and um, her leadership has been extraordinary, and many of you have perhaps already spoken to Jennifer. And if you ha haven't, some member of our committee will be speaking to you. Before we close today, um, I see there are a few sandwiches, so if you didn't get enough to eat, please grab another one um, on your way out. And this is your last chance for comments or questions. Everyone's eager to get out into the sunshine and 60 degrees today. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for those of you who are on Zoom. Uh, we appreciate your attention and uh, for taking the time to listen to us today. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Blessings. Thank you.